teachers, doctors, architects, engineers, lawyers, journalists, artists, public servants, everyone they could find that were pillars of the society were assassinated. People were shot just for wearing glasses because it meant you could read. All money was burnt. Pagodas were destroyed and monks were killed. Even the family unit was destroyed with husbands, wives and children being separated and put to work in labour camps divided from each other. Pagodas were burnt and monks murdered, religion was abolished, libraries, all books and even the registrars containing records of births, deaths and marriages were, bought, were burnt and records of land titles were also destroyed. People were reduced to an animal level, often with farm animals being fed more food and treated better than they were. And I want to tell you um, a story about a great Cambodian friend of mine called Siavut, one of my greatest friends back home. I said to him one day, I'm starving, let's go and have lunch. And he looked at me and he said, Geraldine, you don't know what starving means. We had a few drinks at lunch and he told me his story. He was in the labour camps and they were allowed to grow food but they weren't allowed to eat it. If they were found eating it, they were shot. But his friend was so angry and hungry, he took a, um, a, a corn cob of sweet corn and he hid it in secret and ate it at night. Now sweet corn is one of the hardest things you can have to digest. So it made him sick and the next day he had diarrhoea and lost all the sweet corn. Siavut, my friend, was so hungry, he picked up the yellow kernels out of the diarrhoea and took it to the river and washed it and ate it. And he said, Geraldine, that's what hunger is. So I never now say, I'm hungry. Out of a population of seven million, an estimated two million were killed through assassination, starvation, torture or hard labour. Never in recorded history had a population of people been so completely decimated and destroyed by their own people. It can be compared to what the Germans did to the Jews in World War II, but this time it was Cambodians killing their own people. And a new word was entered into the dictionary, autogenocide. Even today, in modern Phnom Penh, there is no one who has not lost a close family member, or if they survived, they are living with memories so tormenting that many of them cannot function normally. It is not an exaggeration to say that all the survivors of the killing fields of, um, of 75 to 79 are suffering in various degrees from post-traumatic stress disorders that are not being treated because there are very few psychiatrists or psychologists in Cambodia. They were all killed. Then in late 79, the Vietnamese the North Communist Vietnamese, not the South Vietnamese, who fought and lost the war against communism, marched on Cambodia and liberated the Cambodians by ousting Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge from power. But the terror was not over for the Cambodians, who then were subjected to the very communism they had fought so hard to resist before Pol Pot ruined their lives. Under the Vietnamese occupation from 79 to 92, Communism was forced upon them, and again, they were not masters of their own fate. The Vietnamese, to be fair, recognised the need for people to be more educated. But because there was no one left alive to do this, they shipped those considered to be capable and intelligent to other communist countries like China, Russia, Poland and Czechoslovakia, where they learned their communist ways and came back with bachelor and, and master's degrees. So slowly the deserted schools and universities began to awaken and take in students. But it was not really until the United Nations came in to supervise the departure of the Vietnamese in 1992 that the education system was free to try and organise itself from the ashes. Still, sadly, no university degrees from Cambodia are recognised internationally. So if you are a, a master's degree student, you know you can never go overseas and, and practice what you've learned. The UN sponsored the first free and fair elections in Cambodia uh, that they had ever had in 30 years in May 93, and democracy was born in Cambodia. 
but democracy was just a word. Cambodians didn't know the meaning of the word democracy. But with the terror of the Pol Pot days still ringing in their heads, the people were afraid to embrace education like the rest of the world has hoped. What they had learned was that it was dangerous to be intelligent. Um, even now, my kids at Sunrise, when we have lessons and the teachers ask questions, nobody puts their hand up to answer the, the questions. And I say, say how you know the answer to that question. And he won't put his hand up. And it's because they don't like to draw attention to the fact that they're intelligent. At the government primary schools, we often have to provide desks and chairs for them because the school has no money. In schools of over 2,000 children, there are often two toilets with no water to wash. So just think about that for a moment. And the main reason why girls stop attending school is for the very simple fact that when they start to menstruate, they have no suitable toilet facilities, so they stay home. The whole education system is an area where Cambodia has to make huge steps forward before it can come out of the mist. At the schools, there are no computers, no electricity or fans, no canteens, no playing fields, no extra extracurricular activities, no substitute teachers when ones are away, and often not enough books for everyone, and any misbehaviour is punished with a firm swish of a long bamboo cane. If you believe in reincarnation, you would definitely hope that you don't come back to Cambodia as a child in current Cambodia. We have one of the highest child mortality rates in the world. 35% of the population is under the poverty line, existing on less than a dollar a day. 64% of girls never enter primary school. 12% of 12 to 14 year old kids are in the labor force and 70% of the population has no access to clean water. It is rare to see children of kindergarten age playing constructively as they do not have toys that we are familiar with and their parents would also have had no experience in teaching games to prepare their children for an education because they had no toys either. Kids play happily for hours with rubber bands, tin cans, coconut shells and old bicycle spare parts. A good education for primary age children, even for those whose families can afford to pay, is seriously limited because the salaries of teachers is as low as $60 a month and does not attract people to want to study ed educational courses to be teachers at the local universities. So children grow up in an environment of great lack in the standards of those around them who are their educators. The Sunrise School bus drives past many farmers' children working in the fields near us and they wave and smile at us, but you can see the longing in their eyes to be on that bus with us going to school. For them, school is just a dream. Now, I hate it when people in my organisation has a good idea and it's not mine. Or well, this is an idea that my manager had and it's just wonderful. He said to me, Mum, he said, all the villages outside our fence are subsistence farmers. Mum and Dad go to the fields every day, which means that their primary school children have to stay home to look after the Littleys. Why don't we open up in all our centres nursery schools where the small kids can come, leaving the primary school kids free to go to school? Such a fabulous idea. We have now in, in um, our centres now as many as 3,000 kids coming, small ones, to nurseries every, every morning leaving their brothers and sisters able to go to school. And it's making a huge difference. Um, but I just hate it when people have good ideas and it's not mine. And we at Sunrays take many abandoned babies from local hospitals and have a good relationship with many hospital staff. Parents of sick children often have to sell a cow to get a taxi fare to reach a free hospital. And then one of two things happen. If the child recovers, the parents are told, well, look, he's better now, but um, he may get sick in the future. And the mum and dad know that they don't have another cow to sell. So they abandon the child in hospital, not out of a lack of love, but hoping someone like Sunrise will come along and take care of the kids that they can't afford to care for. 
And then the second thing that happens in the hospitals, the doctors say, look, I'm sorry, your kid's got a disease and he'll die in six months or one year or even less. And the parents again are faced with the cruel fact that they don't have the six dollars to give their child a proper Buddhist cremation. So they leave the children in the hospital who call us and we take the kids and we give those kids as much love as we can for as long as we can and we give them a, a good Buddhist funeral. Um, uh, that's the case for children that are abandoned in hospitals. Um, one of my girls has been very, very badly burned by um, an acid burn attack and her name is Wow. And she is now 20. She came to us when she was 10. Horrifically burnt. She had an eye and an ear burnt out and horrific facial uh, burns. Um, because she was trafficked into Thailand to be a beggar. And in the begging ring that she was working for, she was told she wasn't getting enough money, so they threw acid on her. Um, she was eventually rescued, put into the immigration prison, where I hate to think what happened to her until the Office of International Migration stepped in and brought her back to us. We love her because we know her. We don't see her damaged face. But now she's 18 and she's outside in the community. And she said, oh, mum, people point at me and they call me a ghost and a monster. And she said, it's horrible. And I said, how do you cope with that? Wow, what do you do? And she said, I put my head up and I turn around to them in, in Khmer and I say, what I look like is not who I am. And we have, we have great hopes for, for Wow, because she has such a wonderful, wonderful, um, optimistic character. Now, Cambodia has taught me one thing, and that is not to waste my precious time and energy on things I can't change. So the children that do, through their fate, find their way to sunrise are the ones I concentrate on. I see many kids in the street where I just want to scream the car to a, to a stop and jump out and grab them, but I can't. Through each child's fate, if they get to us, they have a better life. I have children with AIDS, TB, polio, hepatitis B, brittle bone disease and acquired aplastic anemia, which is a very serious blood disease caused by the spraying of Agent Orange, as we heard about yesterday. Um, I have kids with varying degrees of cerebral palsy, mental and emotional conditions, and it is commonplace uh, that I have two young girls who have been terribly disfigured in acid burns. The resilience of these kids has to be seen to be believed, and the way the other children at Sunrise have accepted their fellow brothers and sisters' disabilities by loving and nurturing them is something I have not taught them. It has come naturally from a Buddhist belief of love compassion and tolerance. When a female child is vulnerable after the death or abandonment of a parent, she's grabbed quickly by those in the villages and who can profit from their virginity. Girls as young as seven and boys too are sold into brothels where they are taught how to please men sexually. I say to my friends, there's nothing you can tell me about Cambodia that won't shock me. Um, but one day I was down at the riverfront uh, waiting for some friends for dinner and I was sitting at the bar and th there were two middle-aged Americans at the other end of the bar and they were very, very upset about something and they were shouting. And I went down to them and I said, what's the problem? I live here, but maybe I can help you. And they said, we can't believe it. We just came in from outside and a young man came to us with a big folder with um, photos of disabled children, blind kids kids who had lost both legs from landmines, um, kids with serious mental disabilities, uh, the worst kind of um, mental retardation. And this man said to us, you want sex with disabled child, you tell me which one I go and get. And I couldn't eat my dinner that night to think that the world has come to this, that there are men out there who want to make disabled kids' lives more miserable by forcing sex on them. So the next day I went to a friend of mine, a Cambodian soldier who works for the uh, anti-trafficking uh, unit. And she's a big soldier, tough. She's been on the front line, she's killed people. She's a tough cookie. And I said to her this story. And I said, please, you've got to send your um, uh, plainclothes police down to the riverside and stop this ring. 
and down the face of this very, very tough, hardened soldier, when one tear ran down her face and she said, Geraldine, we know all about it, but we can't do anything because the police are getting their cut. So these are times when um, I have to say to myself again, don't waste my energy worrying about things I cannot change. But these are days I go home, have three double gin and tonics and bang my head against the wall because these are things that I, I just cannot change. And there are agencies that often raid these premises and rescue children, but the physical and emotional damage is more often than not beyond repair. Um, I had one local NGO uh, tell me that they had um, a, a girl who had been uh, a sex slave for about three years. She was then about 14. Um, but they said they couldn't take care of her and they brought her to us and she was totally catatonic. Um, so I then had to send her off to uh, another place that had more facilities than we had. She couldn't feed herself. She was totally mentally normal, but just totally unresponsible. She'd closed the whole world out. It can be a dangerous, depressing, dirty, difficult country. But when I see the love for me in the eyes of my children, nothing could ever make me leave this magical country. Um, time for a couple of funny stories, yeah? Um, when I went back to Cambodia for the second time in the 90s, um, the government sent um, a uh, army truck to the border and it was just a truck with a rocket launcher shoved onto the top and a few soldiers to get us through the safe areas. And alongside the roads, there were every couple of hundred metres, there were the skull and crossbone signs nailed on trees to let you know that this was a landmined area. But I'd had, had something that had disagreed with me that, that the night before and I really needed to go to the toilet and I'd go nowhere in Cambodia without my roll of toilet paper. So I jumped out of the car and I waved this roll of toilet paper into the soldiers to make him understand what I wanted because I'd seen a little track, clear track, leading from the road through to a village. And I thought, well, that track must be okay because the villagers are often you know, using it. So I got out and I started to walk down the track and this little soldier about this big stood in front of me with his M16 and he stopped me from going. And I tried the other way and he stopped me from going. He's about this big. And, um, he, and I'm waving the toilet paper and going like this. And he said to me, Commander say me if Madame die, I die, so Madame shit here. <laughs> Just what I had to do. When you gotta go, you gotta go. Um, one story that's quite old but still brings tears uh, to, to my eyes is little Lai Tai. He was a traffic boy from Thailand where his mother had sold him into a begging ring. He had severe cerebral palsy on his legs, but his brain was as sharp as a tack. So he eventually got re repatriated back to us. And it was round about the time that I was doing my yearly reports to um, sponsors, giving them an update on what their kid is doing. You know, and it's boring stuff like my favourite fruit, my favourite friend, what I want to be when I grow up, my favourite animal, like really, really boring stuff. So I wanted it to be a little bit more sexy. So the last question was, what would you ask Buddha for if you had half an hour with him? And the boys were saying they wanted sports cars and motorbikes and computers, the usual things. And the girls were saying they wanted rich husbands, jewellery and a lovely house. And I got to little Lai Tai. He's sitting on the chair, um, wagging his deformed legs that didn't even reach the ground. And I said to him, Tai, what would you ask Buddha for? And he said, oh, Mum, Buddha's very busy and, and very important. He said, I don't need anything. I wouldn't ask him for anything. And I said, you've got to tell me something, darling, because I'm doing the report to your sponsor. You've got to tell me something you want. So finally, he looked up in the sky and he said, well, Mum, the only thing I want is for Buddha to make me a really, really good person in this lifetime because I must have done something very bad in my previous life for my mother to throw me away and for me to be a cripple. So if Buddha makes me a really good person in this lifetime, maybe, just maybe, in my next lifetime, I'll have a mother that keeps me and loves me and doesn't throw me away. Um, sorry to keep on with the sad stories, but I'm trying to paint a picture of life for a child in Cambodia. Some street children are kidnapped and th their body parts are sold 
and I have one story I hope I can get through without bawling my eyes out. It's about a little boy called Noodles and I was in one of the local markets. Uh, I buy silk and silver and things to take home to sell and I'm quite know well known there and my silk lady, she said, oh, Mum Geraldine, she said, there's a little boy being abandoned on a noodle stall and the noodle stall owners are taking care of him and we call him Noodles. Maybe you can take him to sunrise. So I went to the noodle store and there was this gorgeous eight-month-old baby with big black eyes. And I looked down at him and I said, oh, look, darling, I can't take you today. I'm going to Australia. Um, when I come back, I'll, I'll come and get you. So I went to Australia, I did my fundraising and I came back. I'd been back about a week and I thought, oh, noodles, I must go and get noodles. And I went back to the marketplace, to the noodle stall, to find that people had harvested his eyes, both of them, to sell to rich Cambodians for their, for their retinas. And there was this totally blind boy. I lost it. I was throwing plates and smashing glasses and people were calling the police because I, I was out of control and the um, noodle shop owners packed everything up and then ran off with noodles. And I don't know where he is or what happened to him. And no matter how much good I do and how many children I help, this always haunts me that this is one boy I failed. So from now on, if I see a child in a vulnerable situation, I don't wait. I take them on the spot so that nothing like that can ever happen to them like happened to Noodles. Um, another funny story, okay. Um, during the coup in 1997, when the um, military overthrew the royal family, um, I was um, stuck at the orphanage, which, unknown to me, was military grounds. And the soldiers came out after a few days on a tank. I only had 70 children then. They came out on a tank, six soldiers, armed to the teeth, and were yelling at us and telling us to leave their land. And I, when I'm angry, my Khmer becomes very good. And I was going up to these hard-nosed soldiers and I'm saying, does your mother know what you're doing here today? And it was just going straight over their heads. And the kids are pulling my skirt, trying to pull me away from the soldiers because they were scared. And the kids were so scared, they were wetting themselves with fear. And then all of a sudden, the head soldier took a step forward and he looked me up and down. He looked at my hair, stepped back, put his gun down, nudged the soldier next to him, whispered to him. That soldier gave me the once over, again looked at my hair, put his gun down nudged the soldier next to him until the whole six of them had put their guns down and got on the tank and left us alone. And we went inside, we were all shaking, we didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And the older boys said, oh mum, you know what saved us? Your hair saved us. And I said, what do you mean my hair saved us? He said, in Cambodia, when husbands are unfaithful and the wives find out, there's a very special witch that they go to and this witch turns their husband's penises to the size of a pea. <laughs> and she's got very bright red hair. Um, in Cambodia, there's nobody that I know of with hair this colour. And the kids reckon that the soldiers took a look at me and didn't want to take any chances. <laughs> so whenever I go back to Cambodia, half my suitcase is filled with hair colour. I'm actually white as the walls. Um, but I'm going to be red um, forever as long as, as long as I live in um, Cambodia. Uh, some other good um, stories, we've been able to get scholarships for some students to study in Australia and they've returned with film degrees, nursing degrees, high hospitality degrees and are now working in the best hotels with the best salaries and are really making an independent life for themselves. In Cambodia we have young students doing bachelor degrees in law, medicine, civil engineering, architecture, agriculture, banking, social, social work, uh, finance, administration, education and management. And this is the next generation who will be able to bring Cambodia out of the mist. Uh, and it's strange how sometimes the kids find their real vocation. Uh, one of my boys called Panya desperately wanted to be an architect. Uh, and to be an architect you have to pass an entrance exam and he did the entrance exam and he came home with his head down and showed me his papers and he got zero. Um, the only thing he got right was his name, and he was devastated. Anyway, he now has found his true um, love in life. He's doing agriculture. He's in his third year, 
and he's just won a scholarship to go to Israel um, to do more in agriculture. So that's uh, one of my, my good stories of one of my kids finding his own way. And for those who cannot get into university, we provide vocational training. Not everybody wants to go to university. I've got you know, boys that want to do boy stuff. And uh, we're getting vocational training for them to become car mechanics, air conditioner engineers, generator experts, plumbers, electricians, mobile phone repairers, chefs, florists, and beauty therapists. We've got a few gay boys um, in the centre and they're all clamouring to be beauty therapists and florists. And no one leaves Sunrise without being prepared for an independent future. We already have lots of students working in hotels, the insurance and IT industries. Some are dental hygienists and many of them have married and are bringing up their own families. Um, I just had um, another grandchild while, I, while I've been here. Uh, one of my kids has had uh, his second baby. I hope that you will find some of what I'm saying to be inspiring. So now move on to the other topic of this symposium of transforming com uh, communities. In the past, when we started, we were almost exclusively a residential care facility for children in need. This has changed, and although we will always have children with us, we have seen the great need in Cambodia and have now branched out into considerable community development projects to those in need around our five centres. This includes renovating dilapidated schools, giving bikes for kids to get to the school, building a bridge so that the village people can pass to their jobs in the rainy season when they were cut off, providing wells in villages where there was no safe water or often no water at all, constructing livable homes for the destitute, sanitation projects, and we've just opened three health centres free for whole communities. Um, the type of people we're treating, HIV, uh, malaria, dengue, TB is a big one, domestic violence, um, motorbike accidents, uh, skin problems, that kind of thing. And if anyone comes to us that's got something seriously wrong with them, we have two tuk-tuk ambulance um, services that we can take them into town on our tuk-tuks. So the, the people around us are, are really, really happy to be living near sunrise. Um, Many of these communities around us with the children, they not only come to the nursery school, but the children outside come to learn computers, do our sp sporting and arts classes. And in June, we opened a school and bathroom and laundry facilities for children who eke out a living on a local rubbish dump. So, so they could at least have some education and keep themselves clean. And the transformation of these villages we're involved in has been enormous and something we're very proud of. I visited this uh, rubbish dump just before I decided to do this laundry centre for the children. And when the trucks come, the kids come and the parents, they're not orphans, the whole family are uh, scavengers on the dump. And I was there when I went there with our rubbish and the truck tipped everything out and everybody's scrambling with pig stabbers to pick things up. And there was this um, old woman there, um, filthy dirty, shocking, filthy nails, um, couldn't see her feet for the flies and she picked um, a half rotten apple out of one of the uh, rubbish tins and started to eat the other half. And the whole time she was doing this, she was singing a really happy Khmer song. And this is what I love about the Cambodians, they can always find something to smile about and, and be happy. Um, the words orphans and orphanages has for years been acceptable words to describe the situation all over the world for vulnerable children, but now these words are not politically correct and UNICEF have done research proving that children in institutional care suffer in many ways from separation from their extended families and local communities, often making them dysfunctional in their adult lives. UNICEF now have a worldwide program where many orphanages are to be closed down and investigations by government and Sunrise social workers are heavily involved with visiting extended families to see if it is possible for some of our kids to be reintegrated back to their homes and our communities. We continue though to pay for their education and visit regularly and we give rice every month. If the home needs a bathroom uh, or a kitchen, we also build that for them. And we give them other staple goods every month. 
So they are still um, Sunrise children. Uh, some of these reintegrations have worked out and some have been disastrous. It's like everything, some good and, and some bad. Everything in life is about change and this is no exception. Sunrise has embraced this new world of thinking and we, we are working hard to achieve all the challenges involved. But I have to tell you, when I see a kid of 16 who's been with me since he was two, sent back to his community, I'm not exactly happy. And we have, um, the night before, we have um, a farewell party for each child before they leave the next day. And we get cake and soft drinks and everything in. And we try and give them a farewell party. And the only song we know is Happy Birthday, so we sing Happy Birthday for, for them leaving. The kid that leaving is crying, their friends are crying, the cooks are crying, the nannies are crying, I'm crying, and the dogs are going, Whoa. Um, So everybody understands. Um, but it's the way the world is going now, and I, I have to go along with it. Um, one of the most rewarding and exciting things I've ever done in my life was to get out of my comfort zone. Before I moved to Cambodia in the 90s, I had a very comfortable and privileged lifestyle. Um, I worked for um, the Diplomatic Corps as a secretary for ambassadors in... Uh, Cambodia was my first posting. And then the Philippines, uh, Thailand, Iran and Washington DC. And then I resigned from public service and went to Sydney to be the PA for the uh, Chase Manhattan Bank country manager. And um, I was bored rigid there, absolutely bored rigid. And um, my attitude towards my work showed and after eight years um, I got fired, which is really um, a pretty frightening aspect. And then I thought, what am I gonna do? I'm 50 and fired. Um, and then Cambodia called me back. It was my destiny to go back to Cambodia. Um, and then when I went back to Cambodia, it was not the Cambodia I remembered from the 70s where I had a chauffeur-driven car to work, a lovely apartment, a housekeeper, um, everything done for me. I was just another foreign woman on the streets. And it was there that I find, found, uh, found out who I really was and what I could achieve. And it's not until your backs are against the wall that you will come to know your strengths and what you can achieve and who you really are. And I pity those who spend their whole lives being safe and comfortable, never knowing who they can really be. Don't take my word for it, try it. Um, I'm totally unqualified to do what I'm doing. Um, I left school at 15, I never finished grade nine. And if I had gone to the Australian authorities and said, look, I wanna uh, work taking care of children, they would have said, Oh, well, Miss Cox, that's nice. Um, what's your, you've got a nursing degree, a teaching degree, a social work degree, perhaps? And I'd have to say no. They would have never let me work with kids. But when they work with children, what is it you do? You shelter them, you feed them, you clothe them, you educate them, you keep them clean, you take care of their medical needs, you discipline them and you teach them the difference between right and wrong. You protect them, you comfort them, you wipe away their tears, you hug and you kiss them. You play with them, you make them laugh. You encourage them, you fight their battles for them, you protect them, you make them feel safe. You support them and you find their talents and nurture them. You forgive them you believe in them, you teach them tolerance and kindness, you trust them, you guide them, and tell them they have a future. But most of all, you tell them that you love them and that you will always be there for them. Where's the need for a university degree? Your parents did all of those things for you, and not all of your parents would have had university degrees. Looking out at your young and eager faces gives me hope for the world and mankind. And if I have any message for you, it is to find your passion and joy in life and to embrace it. Living without your passion is like being only half alive. I was only half alive until I was 50 and went to Cambodia. You don't have to run off to the jungles of Cambodia to find your passion and, and your real purpose in life. 
um, it can be bringing up a family and having a healthy, loving family life. It can be in service to the community. It can be in the corporate world, closing big business deals. It can be in the world of academia. It can be in the world of music and arts. It can be through research. It can be through sport. It can be through medicine and healing. It can be in politics. It can be in your religion. But it is there and you have to find it. Maybe there are people in this room who will find cures for cancer, AIDS and other illnesses. Maybe in this room are people who will find ways to clean our rivers and seas. Maybe in this room are people who can heal the earth and make Mother Nature start to forgive us for what we have done to her. My generation could not do it. You have to. But please, find that button to press that makes you know you're alive. All of you here today are here to learn how to make the world a better place. A man who has done more than any of us can dream to achieve put it so simply. Nelson Mandela said in his 1994 inaugural speech in Africa, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that most frightens us. You are about to decide what you want to do with the rest of your working lives. Some of you may already know what you want to be. Many others will not. Trust your teachers and your counsellors and be guided by their advice. But listen to what your heart tells you. It knows you better than anyone else. But please know that the greatest currency you will ever possess is how you affect others in the world. So always remember to be kind. That is your biggest currency. So please make today the first day in your life to start building your lifetime dreams. But don't forget to have lots of fun along the way. I certainly did. And my children know that I'm talking about their lives and they have asked me to pass on to all of you their sunrise blessing. And the older boys got together and they came up to me with this little list and they said, please tell all the people who might want to help sunrise that we in Sunrise wish all of them long life, health, strength, wisdom, and what we all need most in the world, they wish you peace. And I said to the kids, hang on. I said, wealth's not in that list. And one of my teenage boys stood up and rolled his eyes and he said, Mom, if you've got long life, health, strength, wisdom and peace, you're already rich and you should know that. And I just love it how my kids teach me more than I could ever teach them every day. So thank you very much for listening to me today. And <laughs> please. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Faith Banka from Wilkes University in the United States. Um, you said that your kids have taught you some of the greatest life lessons. What would you say one of the, or the greatest life lesson that they have taught you is? Resilience. My children are so resilient and I haven't taught it to them. Uh, it's something to do with um, Cambodian nature and the Buddhist religion that helps them accept whatever it is that's happened to them and just move on. In the West, we have psychiatric um, counselling. We have uh, so many places that we can go, go to. But in Cambodia, each person heals their own internal problems. And there's a wonderful feeling of national resilience that I don't have. I fall apart at this, you know, every day. Um, and this, th I wish that this resilience was all over the world like it is in Cambodia. So resilience is what it's taught me most. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name's Tom. I'm from Newcastle University in Australia. Um, first of all, I'd like to just say thank you so much for um, doing your uh, talk and you have changed my life. Um, whenever I hear the word noodle, uh, until the end of my days, I'll think of this and I'll think of this story. Um, I was, my question is, can I please come up and hug you and kiss you? Right, man. 
Mann. Make those tears work for you. Uh, yes, my name is Patricia from Florida Atlantic University in the United States. First off, I want to say thank you for the message. I've never heard such a resounding message permeate in so many hearts from so many different countries, so thank you. Um, the question that I have is, um, does the Khmer Rouge have, still have a presence in Cambodia, and if they do, does it affect the developing country, that the last, development of the country? That, that last bit again I didn't get. Does the Khmer Rouge still have a presence in the country? And oh. does it affect the development um, of the country? Officially, the Khmer Rouge don't exist. Um, there are some aging Khmer Rouge that are in government. Um, I have a, a girlfriend who's 60, and she works as a nurse. And every morning when she goes to work, there is a man who is a gardener in the hospital who, during her times in the labor camp, raped her nearly every day and he sneers at her every morning because he knows she's going to be too afraid to tell anybody. So there are uh, Khmer Rouge that have changed their names and uh, have got jobs and, and are hiding but I don't think they'll ever be um, an armed presence again. But in instances like I just told you about my girlfriend, there are cases where um, their past as Khmer Rouge uh, still frightens people. So it does exist, but I don't, don't believe the Khmer Rouge will ever come back in a way to, to do what it ever did before. Okay, okay hello, uh, I'm Shi Jie uh, from Delhi University of Technology, which is in the northeast part of China. Um, uh, as far as I know, street children not only exist in one country, but almost every country. So I was wondering, once these street children are set down, how can their mental problems be solved in a better way? Since we know that childhood experience can affect a, a person's whole life. So could you give us some advice on that? Thank you. Um, many, many street children are not orphans. Their parents send them out to beg. Uh, they go home and they, they, they sleep and they live with their families, but it's the families that send them out. Um, we had w one boy who was a s street boy, um, and what happens at the end of the day, the big street, beggar, uh, the big street boys beat up the little ones and take their money. Um, but this boy um, resisted, and as punishment, the bigger boys, they got a T-shirt with dried leaves, set fire to it, and put it up his shirt and set fire to him. And so he was taken off to the hospital, and when he was cured, the hospital staff um, said, you know, no family has come forward to treat him or to take him away, so will you take him? So we brought him back to Sunrise, and lo he loved it there, just loved it. Um, but then after a month, he disappeared. And I went into town looking for him, because I knew the areas that uh, the kids beg in, and I found him, and I said, get in the car. And um, he got in and he came home and in another month he left again. So three times I went in and I got him from the same area where I know he does his begging. And there is a, um, a, a young man who runs all the street programs. He's not a bad man, it's just his job. And I said to him, can you find out why this boy runs away all the time? So a week later I went back, took this guy out for lunch and I said, why does he run away all the time? And he said, he loves sunrise, he loves you, he loves school, he loves sport, he loves clean bed, he loves a shower, he loves all of that. But at the end of the day, he wants money in his pocket and he doesn't get that at sunrise. And this boy's only seven and at seven you don't see the big picture. He just wants money in his hand at the end of the day. And a lot of street, a lot of street children, if I offered them to come to sunrise, many of them would refuse because they don't get money in their hand at the end of the day. So um, it's going to be and has been um, a problem since the beginning of time, the, the begging of children in the streets. I don't think we'll ever solve it entirely. But remember, often it's caused by the families that send them out. Okay, okay thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Ariel Papa from the Philippines and I'm representing Cardiff University. Um, 
What I'd like to ask is that um, I've noticed that in Home for Children, especially in less developed countries, that despite the support and education they receive from their homes, um, when it's time, when they turn 18 and it's time for them to get out and make a life for themselves, they either, usually they just fall back into begging, petty theft, or sometimes <coughs> after a few weeks or even just a matter of the days, they come back to the doors of the orphanage or the home or the institution begging to be taken back in because they don't know how to survive without that kind of support. So my question is, how do you ensure that these children have the confidence and ability to stand on their own two feet when it's time for them to make their own living? Um, the institutions that you've just spoken about are, are truly at, at fault. Um, one, one of the biggest things we promise every child, no one leaves us at the age of 18 without either passing grade 12. Uh, sometimes they might be 21 before they pass grade 12, but we promise them they'll all get a grade 12 education. Now, at, uh, when the ones pass grade 12, they can choose to go to university, and we counsel them and we find out which bachelor degree suits their personality, and they go to university, and we pay for their fees, we do everything. And for the children that fail, we find vocational training for them so that they um, and can have a job and we promise each child you will not leave here without the skills to have a good independent financially um, good lifetime. So the orphanages that, that just look after them, feed them and clothe them, they are doing the kids a great disservice by not preparing them for adult life. Shame on them. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. My name is Guan Hao. I represent in China. Um, my major is dentistry. So during my, inter uh, during my internship, um, uh, there are many cleft lip and palate children. You know, the so-called rapid mouth, uh, the disorder on the children's mouth. Do you mean like hair, hair lip and things like that? Uh? You're talking about hair lip children with cleft palate and hair lips? On, on the mouth, on the, the mouth. disorder on the mouth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we found that actually the most difficult to heal is their harmed heart. I mean, uh, the additional uh, psychological therapy is not enough. So my question is that um, how can we copy with the community, communities or NGOs to uh, deal with this kind of social problem? So you're talking about the children that are disfigured and are not accepted by the community because of how they look? Yeah, yeah. Due, due to this kind of disorder. Yeah, well it wouldn't be just that disorder, it would be many kind of facial disfigurement. Yeah, facial disorder. Yeah, yeah. Um, these children have to be brought up to be stronger than others because um, they're never going to change how they look. It's like my girl, wow, that turns around and says to people, what I look like is not who I am. Um, these children that have been disfigured have to be given more love, more care, and um, the right jobs have to be found for them so that they're not right in the face of the uh, community. Uh, their lives will be easier if they're doing jobs in the back office, on, um, you know, on phones and doing things where they don't have to fight every day people looking at them. So it's finding the right jobs for these kids uh, will help their life go easier. But you know, you can't stop people from pointing out disfigurements yeah. uh, in other people. It's just the way, unfortunately, we are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.